Oh, hey, Yens. Welcome to the shop for the last time. So Sam and I have been in this shop for pretty much three, actually over three years now. And we've brought Yens along for most of the ride. Oh, my back. Being in here for three years, we've definitely learned a lot about what we like and what we don't like about being here. So we're gonna give you guys some advice on the things we would change about this shop. First thing, don't put your shop next to a train track and make videos for a living. So when we moved in here, if you guys remember, we built this wall and doors and made separate access for storage and the shop itself. We did this in order to make sure our storage situation wasn't something that looked bad in the back of content. The regret in the first tip here is that don't do that. What ended up happening was we have way more stuff than we need, one. Two, we're hoarders. And three, when it's out of sight, it becomes out of mind and just turns into an absolute mess. Right now, Sam has it clean. And yes, if you can imagine, this is what it looks like clean and organized. We've got a bunch of stuff in here getting ready for the move, but we've had to spend at least, I would say two days a quarter getting this thing organized and prepared for whatever we're kind of building out. And it takes time away from what actually makes us money here, which is making content and making stuff, not cleaning up our storage area. So first piece of advice is to either limit your storage area and make sure it's something that you keep organized or if it's gonna be in your shop, it's something that you cannot ignore. That way on a daily basis, you're maintaining the organization and maintaining the cleanliness of it. Because when we put it out of mind, boy, did it get bad. There was a few times where I thought we were just gonna burn this place to the ground. All right, come inside. Tip two is plan better for your machines that are gonna make the most noise. Number one, the dust collector. And number two, your air compressor. We kind of just shoved our air compressor in the furthest corner we could away from everything else, and it turned out to be a terrible decision. First thing we thought is that because it's far away from where we're typically shooting, that the noise won't affect us. Well, let me tell you, it literally does every single time it turns on, we have to stop what we're doing. Also, because we shoved it in this back corner, it's not properly fastened to the ground, and when we release the air from it, we can barely get to it, so it turns into something that we don't do that often, which makes us not maintain our tools the best that we possibly can. The plan was when we moved in here is we wanted to build a soundproof cabinet around the dust collection and the air compressor both being up there when we had a smaller compressor and we just never got around to it. So when you're planning your shop, think about those because both of them make noise and both of them make an unpleasant working environment. The dust collector, not so much, but the air compressor, I literally don't think there's anything worse. We all are just like, Ugh! Why didn't we fix that when we had the chance? Tip number three is gonna be based around your dust collection. Now in other shop tours, I think we did two shop tours of this shop. I talked about how much we like having all of our drops where tools of similar size are going to live, which is great. I still like that concept. What I don't like is that when we planned our dust collection system, we made zero plans for expansion. So what ends up happening is you got a fabric cobbled situation like this. We have one five inch drop over here, two machines that run off of five. This one reduces to four. This one reduces to four. And all three of them are in each other's way. So we're constantly having to move them around. Fortunately, this machine's on wheels. We also didn't plan that if we wanted to add other machines dust collection into the system, how easy or difficult it would be to add those. For instance, our bandsaw. Now, I can't take credit for this masterpiece of dust collection, but a little CNC used to sit here way back in the day. And so we had a drop here, but that drop sucked. It was the furthest thing away from the machine and it was reduced enough that it wasn't pulling a ton of air. And then we had to go and fabric cobble this thing into it. So plan for expansion in your shop. We did all of our electrical and everything over here with these dust collections. And then when we decided to go ahead and get a shaper, we had no room for it. Cause if you might recall, we used to have a drum sander here and then dust collection for all three of them. We had to fabric cobble that together and it no longer works. Same thing happened over here with our sander. We originally had one drop over here and then everything just kind of went to shit. So think about your dust collection system and how you will expand off of it in the future and it will help greatly as you plan and lay out your shop. Tip number four, and this one's gonna seem super basic and very, well, obvious, and it kind of isn't. One, I know most of you are cheap. I'm cheap, Sam's cheap, we won't talk about Jordan's taste, but because of that, when we're building things and we're doing things, we try to go about it in the most reasonable fashion when it comes to finances that we can. 
And one place that I tend to skimp or skimped a lot when we were laying out the shop was electrical service. Now, not necessarily the service itself, but how we went about making sure we had power to our tools. It is a great idea to make sure that all of your tools have dedicated power if you're capable of doing that in your shop, but don't be a cheap ass and only put two, two bangers, we call these a banger, I don't know what they're actually called, two outlet uh, hub in your wall. I cannot tell you how many times we've needed a plug and then had to run an extension cord, which underpowers your tool, which makes a huge pain when it comes to the tripping hazard, especially when you got multiple people and you're shooting content where people are looking up and not down. Just try to avoid extension cords in our workflow. Four outlets would have solved that because we have plugs that are like literally every you know six feet and my cheap ass put double plugs and not quadruple plugs in most of them. So when you can put a four outlet on the wall or wherever you're gonna put it, you'll thank yourself down the line. Tip number five is something we run into quite often in this shop and that is not having enough space for what you build. I know all of us would love to have more space and don't get me wrong, that's why we're moving. We need more space. But when we laid out this shop, we weren't really thinking through the types of projects we built. At the time, I had done a significant amount of larger projects, conference tables, dining tables, banquettes. I did a 13 foot shelf if you guys recall in my last shop. And all of those things are massive. When we laid out this shop, it was like we both neglected that we build massive stuff. So this shop literally doesn't have anywhere indicative to large projects. When we did the black rifle table, we had to move every tool out of this section in order to make a 20 foot run in order to lay that thing out. We used up this entire section here whenever we were building the conference table, uh, the, the 60 liter conference table that we did, our first big resin pour project. We constantly find ourselves needing more space for just the project itself. Not working, because we have big work surfaces uh, in our outfeed table and we have plenty of working room over here, but it's the staging area for your project. So when you're laying out your shop, think about what you build and then what you want to build and make sure you have enough room for it. If you ever plan on building a conference table, don't lay your shop out to have everything stuffed in a corner if you're gonna need to put it somewhere to work on. Trust me, you're gonna wish you had more room, but you can always lay your things out smart. Like a lot of these machines are bolted to the floor and they're really not easy to move. So either put your stuff on wheels or lay out your shop in order to build the projects that you plan on building. Now tip number six is gonna be more for like the semi-professional, professional style shop, but it's a good one. Real quick before we dive into the rest of our advice, I wanna take a second to thank this week's sponsor, Woodcraft. If you've been with us in this shop for the last three years, then you are definitely familiar with Woodcraft. Woodcraft is our go-to brand for all things woodworking. Pretty much every machine we've got in here, you can get at Woodcraft, as well as raw materials, finishes, you name it, Woodcraft's probably got it. They have an unbelievable website where you can purchase things, have them directly shipped to you, which is amazing. And it's super easy to find what you're looking for on their website. They also have stores all over America, which is absolutely amazing. Our local store here, Sam and I have actually become good friends with the people that work there, which is awesome. You can go, you can hang out, or you can go and give them all your money, which is also fun. I even heard rumors they're opening up new stores next year coming up, which is fantastic. If you're a woodworker and you're looking for anything, check out Woodcraft. They're the best, love them. Thank you, Woodcraft. Now, let's get back to these tips. You wanna create an area in your shop that is just completely dedicated to finishing. Let me show you ours. And to be completely honest, it typically looks worse than this. We never actually set up an area in order to finish our projects in. We started out years ago using a lot of hand finishes, which you can do pretty much anywhere. But when we got into spraying more, we were really at the mercy of the fan that's in the wall in the metal shop room. And because it, I don't own this building, I didn't want to invest in a spray booth and blow you know, a hole in the wall and run the venting out and everything. So we just finish projects wherever. There's paint, there's epoxy, there's lacquer and all kinds of stuff all over the floor and all over our tools and stuff in here because we're pretty much just spraying wherever we can find room. It was stupid planning on our behalf because we could have very easily at the beginning of our layout here in this shop, put up a partition wall, had a little corner that was dedicated just to finishing and made sure that we uh, use all of our finishing products in that area. So if you can create an area that's just dedicated to finishing, trust me, you'll thank yourself later. Tip number seven. And yes, I still have my fingers. If you're one of the amazing individuals who has purchased our miter saw station plan, one, thank you because you roll. Two, you'll notice it's quite large, but it's not large enough. <laughs> And when I say that, I mean the size of this and then the size of the shop that we're in, we kind of put it in a place that we thought would fit any means of lumber length that we would need on it. The table itself is just about eight feet wide from one side to the other. But if you come to the one side of it, 
Oh, no, it's my butt. And you want to cut a 12 foot board. You run into all the junk we had to shove in this corner over here and we didn't give ourselves enough room for infeed on our miter station. And it's not the biggest problem we have, but it's still something that like when it happens, you're like, damn it. And then you gotta take it and put out saw horses and cut it by hand. Just slows you down a little bit. Same thing happens in our metal room all the time with our metal chop saw too. So when you're laying out your miter station, whether you have this one or you made one yourself or you're rocking that thing on a pair of saw horses, make sure you give yourself plenty of infeed room in order to break down the materials that you plan on working with. Tip number eight. Climate control. If you have the opportunity in your shop to control the climate, take advantage of that. It's only like 60 something degrees in here, hot though. But also make sure that you're planning for it in the future. Every single one of us lives in a different climate zone. I live in Pittsburgh and so does Sam and our climates are different between our houses and the shop. I know, absurd, but it can get to be that ridiculous. This, when we got in here, we were super pumped about. We got a brand new Mr. Heater to help us keep this shop nice and warm. The last shop, we last three shops I was in, no heat at all, suffering. So we were pumped for this, but this, only heats this. We literally, can, can you come stand right here, which is like 10 feet, you're freezing. And it gets cold here in Pennsylvania. It gets down into the 20s regularly from uh, December through February. And that makes for a very miserable working condition. The other thing here is that we, once again, don't own this building. So I wasn't gonna put the time or effort into insulating this room and making sure it was airtight. Because of that, we put a couple more heaters and they literally just burn electricity. They don't really work. We've hit days in the shop during the winter time that we just 100% didn't wanna be down here. It was miserable. We were freezing. Sam came in full hunting winter garb a few days last year because it was that cold just to hold a camera. It's absurd. We we didn't think about it enough beforehand and in the new shop, we do have that problem solved. The other thing to consider with that is cooling as well because the flip side of us not having heat in the winter is that it is a smoldering hot in this concrete box that we are in in the summer. Everything is on fire! Now, call it what you want. I'm spoiled or whatever, I get it. When you're working somewhere every single day and you're on your feet and you're already putting in effort and labor, you wanna be as close to comfortable as possible. When it's 90 degrees in your shop, it's miserable. It also affects your finishes, also affects your materials. It affects a lot of the kind of stuff we do here. So the tip here is think about temperature control. Think about your heat in the winter if you need it. Think about your cooling in the summer if you can afford it and it's something that you would desire. But most importantly, think about airflow for both of them. We have this nice big heater here, but no air gets to the back. It would have probably been smart to think of that before we put it in the back furthest corner of the shop. Whose idea was that again? That was my uncle Stan's, that bastard. Tip number nine is to think about your lighting. Now, we're really lucky here that we're working with American Green Lights. Our shop lighting is awesome. But when we got in here, it looked just like this. I don't think that one ever worked. The reason I'm going to emphasize lighting though is that because most of you are probably building things that you're either going to want to keep and show off to your friends and family or sell to other people who are then going to show them off to their friends and family. You wanna have your shop lit well enough that when you're inspecting your projects, you can go over them meticulously in a ridiculous lit uh, setting in order to find any defects or any issues so you can make sure that they're not there when you take it into the client's home. In my last two shops, the lighting was poor and I had a few instances where I had inconsistent finishes on projects and it was just because I couldn't see them in my shop. So you'll see a lot of guys that are putting stand lights and stuff next to their projects and all of those are great tips and great ideas. But if your shop is lit up like a star, the stars that we are like this, it gives you, a, it's an advantageous situation to help you find that beforehand. Then you don't have to concern yourself all the time with grabbing a little light, putting it on your surface and then going ahead and doing your finishing work on there. So light that thing up if you can. And finally, the tenth tip or thing we would change in this shop is don't be married to your shop's layout. What I mean by that is in my last two shops, I was constantly moving things around to create more efficiency. When we got into this shop, Sam and I thought we had it all figured out from the get-go. So like I was telling you earlier, a lot of things are bolted to the floors. Our dust collection is hard piped in. We have things that are not on wheels because we don't like wheels and also we're stubborn. None of that plays well to when you need to kind of readjust your workflow. It makes a, what should be like a simple move into days or 
of weeks in order to redo things. Now, I know a lot of you are probably in a shop that's around a thousand square feet, and I've been there. Everything in my old shops were always based around uh, dust collection and electricity, and I always gave myself an opportunity to move and bob and weave and kind of move stuff around. So when you're laying out your shop, think about that. Think about what you might like to improve into the future. Um, if you're gonna need more room at the front end, if you have a, in the summertime, you know, you got a door you can open behind you, and you can't open in the winter, stuff like that. Don't be married to one specific layout. Be open-minded when it comes to laying out your shop. So that's gonna be a wrap on this video. Sam and I put a considerable amount of time into thinking about what we would have done different when we got this shop set up. I hope this helps you guys in your shop layout. I appreciate every single one of you that have been with us in this shop for the last three years, and we're really looking forward to showing you guys the new one. If you're not subscribed, this is gonna be the time because the chaos is coming, and it's gonna be right here.